This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is the BBC. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, Afra Ben was a prolific playwright for the Restoration stage, a poet, a writer of fiction and a sometimes spy. And her life spanned one of the most turbulent times, turbulent times in English history. She was born as the Civil War started in 1640, flourished under the restored Stuart monarchy and stayed loyal to James II after the Glorious Revolution, right up to her death in 1689. And she was the first English woman to make her living from writing. As tastes changed, she was dismissed as too bawdy, but Virginia Woolf wrote, All women together ought to let flowers fall upon the grave of Afra Ben, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. With me to discuss Afra Ben are Janet Todd, former president of Lucy Cavendish College, Cambridge University, Ross Ballister, professor of 18th century literature at Mansfield College, University of Oxford, and Claire Bowditch, professor postdoctoral research associate in English and drama at Loughborough University. Jan Todd, how much do we know about Afra Ben's early life? Well, not a lot, but she was clearly humbly born. Um, we think that her father was a, a barber in Kent. Um, she was born into this tumultuous time, as you've already mentioned, um, and for the rest of her life she had a horror of um, civil strife and Puritan rule, the notion of a government that has to control behaviour and morality. Um, her mother appears to have been a wet nurse in a more elevated family, and I think it's probably through that connection that she gets to know a man called Killigrew, who, when the res- Restoration comes, um, is both involved in the uh, Secret Service and in the theatre. And, of course, Ben comes into history first as a secret agent. But in terms of her childhood, Jermaine Greer said we must be prepared to live with what we do not know about her early years. That is what we are doing, I think, mm. rather substantially. I hope one day there will be more known. But it isn't, is it sure that her father was a barber in Kent? It seems to be more sure that her mother was a wet nurse, doesn't it? I think the barber bit is is pretty secure. It's all circumstantial because it's... Um, She's not born into the kind of family that keeps letters in the attic and that has a big house where they can control and hold their own archives. So it's not surprising that very little is known. And the fact that she is constantly referred to as someone humbly born, I think, is is fair enough. But what I think is almost more important than exactly what her provenance was is where did she get her amazing education? She is obviously an autodidact. She obviously makes a great use of everything and everybody she knows. And she's just a very, very clever girl. But nonetheless, she learns how to write in all genres. She learns how to comport herself among the learned, among, among men who are the inns, at the inns of court. She learns all that somewhere. That was the question I was going to ask you. Yes, Where well, did she learn it? Well, please don't, because <laughs> I don't know. We, all I can do is speculate, and I think it's to do with these connections that she makes. Uh, Somehow the, through the wet nurse, she got into the libraries of one or two great big yes, houses with, with libraries and I think she took to reading did. books. And I think That's she the best we can do, is it? I think it's the best we can do, and I think it's a lot. Yes, I, think it a lot I mean, a lot of people who are very clever can get there through their wit. Um, and I think the other thing is it's a period in which women could do this, um, the period in which women could, um, who are clever, witty and, and pretty as well, um, could actually rise and get to a position where they could hobnob with people with, of learning and education. And this is in the terrible Civil War period, yes. masses of deaths, and, and then in the Cromwellian period, the period of what was called the Commonwealth and so on. And she's doing that then. But we do know she was a spy in we Antwerp. We do know that, for well, sure. you're on your own, Jan, away she go. How did you get to be a spy in Antwerp? <sighs> right. <laughs> I was hoping I was going to be asked about her, her theatrical world, but... Um, I think she was already a spy when she went to Suriname, which is an amazing place for a woman to go at that time. Um, and I think that because she was already being called Astrea, which was her code name later and her theatrical name. And in Suriname, she also met a William Scott, who was a dissident, a Republican and an enemy of the king. 
Um, and when she was definitely a spy in Antwerp, codenamed 160 and called Astrea again, she was sent there to bring in this William Scott and make him turn into a double agent so that he would, walk, he would work for the um, government of Charles II. And we've actually letters and reports and how she's yes, we have saying, her I need more money to do she this job. She wrote endlessly about needing more money. And I think all through her life, most of her letters that we have are asking for money. Rose Ballison, what was the state of the theatre when Ben began to write? Did she write, did she say, how, why did she begin to write for the state? Well, as Jan said, it's, it seems likely that it's the, this connection with Thomas Killigrew. Um, we know that in her novel that she publishes in 1688 called Orinoco, um, Jan, um, Afra Ben mentions that she sent some Indian feathers from Suriname to Killigrew to the King's Company for a performance. Um, this, so I think she has connections with the stage and I suppose what Jan's outlined here is a situation where she clearly wasn't making money through the other careers that she tried. Spying wasn't working um, and um, and she doesn't seem to, she doesn't seem to have been a very effective spy. Um, so I think she turns to the stage to try and earn money. Um, she probably looks at models like John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell, who were um, the rising professionals in the stage at the time. I think it's worth understanding what the theatre's like in this period. Yes, because it had been closed down in 1642. Exactly, it had been closed. It opened up again, but indeed. only two theatres compared with the massive theatres there were in, as it were, That's Shakespeare right. and post-Shakespearean right. world. And, it's an and entirely, it was very different. Yeah, Can you tell us about how different kind it was? Of theater. Like? I mean, lots of people sort of say, this isn't just a revival or a restoration, it's a reinvention of theatre. Um, Charles II does two things that are very significant. He gives two patents to two companies that are called the Duke's Company and the King's Company. Killigrew runs the King's Company. Davenant runs the, the Duke's Company. Most of Ben, all of Ben's plays until 1682 are performed by the Duke's Company, interestingly. So that's James, named after James, Duke of York, later James II. And he seems to have been... Um, the member of the royal family, the monarch that yeah, but Ben how did the was most theatre came back as a different thing. What different thing was it? Okay, so it's it's a patent theatre. It's owned by those managers, whereas previously yeah, they were stock with, companies. Women can play women. Well, the second part in his second um, in sixteen six. Well, a few years later, um, Charles passes an edict that says all parts for women must be played by women. And interestingly, he says that because he says otherwise um, there are scurrilous and obscene passages that are given to female parts. So he's saying, actually, that he's going to make the theatre more respectable by having women play these parts. Our impression is, of course, that this, this is a kind of enormous novelty and excitement, seeing women playing female parts on the stage. Is it true that the women are now legitimately allowed to go to the theatre for the first time? Or had they gone before? I think they'd always gone to the theatre before. Um, I think there are new kinds of parts for women that sort of... Ben starts her career writing tragic comedies, actually, and and those tragic comedies have amazing parts for women. They're sort of the commandeering, powerful woman, the woman who kind of commands love with her eyes. That These extraordinary actresses like um, Elizabeth Barry, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester's uh, mistress, uh, and Nell Gwynne, who have real stage presence and are really attractive to the audience. So they're a draw, they're a lure to this new kind of theatre. When you say she decided to go to the theatre to make a living, it was very risky. Why did she? What sort of living did she make in the beginning? It's really, it's, a, it's really difficult for us to work out what people earned from some theatrical work. Again, what's different about these theatres in the Renaissance period, an act, a playwright received sort of eight pounds for their script, and it was then owned by the company. In this period, the playwright earns the profits from the third night of a performance. Um, so once all of the cost is taken out, you get the profits. You might, if you run to a sixth or ninth night, you might get those profits. Another bit of earning might come from publishing your play. You might get about £10 for that three months later. If you're a man, you might get some dedication. Dryden, some money from dedications. Dryden's an interesting case. He's, he's successful on the stage before Ben. In the late 1660s, Dryden is commissioned by the King's Company to write three plays a year. So he's probably doing quite well out of that. Ben doesn't have that kind of contract. Women never get that kind of contract. So she has to make money. Uh, she's as good as her last play, basically. Um, and when the theatres go into doldrums, Ben's fortune tends to drop. We see her moving into other genres. 
the plays in 1682, the two companies come together. There are far fewer new plays. Ben turns to fiction and then comes back to drama uh, when the when the theatrical scene revives again. Claire Burditch, were, were there other women writing plays at the time? <coughs> writing plays at the time. She was the most successful, we know, but, but were there others around? She was the most successful, but yes, by the time that she started writing for the stage in 1670, 1671, there were at least two other women around at that time. Uh, the first was Frances Boothby, who wrote a tragic comedy. As Ros said, that's where Ben started her dramatic career. Uh, the one who came either slightly after or about the same time as Ben, was Elizabeth Polwill. But as far as we know, they both only had one play performed, uh, whereas Ben ran for, for two decades, nearly. Can you give us an that. overview of the sort of plays that, <coughs> that Afro Ben was writing? Uh, indeed, she started with the tragic comedy, and in 1673, for her third play, she moved to comedy. Uh, the third play was... Definitely a trial in comedy. She hadn't quite got the sense of space and how the, the stage worked uh, down at, at that point. And she really continued with comedy right the way through her career until just before her death when she returned to one, one tragic comedy. And she's in a very... She's, you've mentioned Dryden has been mentioned, mm. but there's also Witchley around and Etheridge around. And, and Ravenscroft and, and as Ravenscroft well. And Ravenscroft yes. and so on. So she's in with a lot of uh, very successful men. Do they resent her? Do they bring her on? What, what's, what's their view? Is there a view... Is there known to be a collective view that they have of this woman being very successful, or getting a lot of plays on, anyway? I think amongst her immediate colleagues, uh, she does command their respect. Mm, they write yeah. prologues and epilogues mm, f for her yeah. plays, uh, which might be, indeed, interpreted as some kind of professional compliment. Mm. Uh, even when we get into her prose and some of her translations, she's receiving ded dedicatory verses from her her peers that are extremely complimentary. That's not to say that everybody about her uh, was complimentary about her, but... As I understand it by this time, she's been married, but the marriage didn't last very long. How is she living? Have we any idea? <coughs> is she living in a little lodging in Cheapside? Where is she? We don't know exactly where she was living. Uh, we do know that she could keep a servant. So she was... Uh, she had about mm. enough money to keep a servant. Um, but... In terms of her location, we assume she's immediately London-based and probably somewhere near the theatre on, on the Thames, but we don't have a, a location for her. As I understand it, her first notable success was a play called uh, The Rover, 1677. Yes. What was, why was that a success, do you think? Um, I think The Rover was especially successful because what it did was to give the Restoration audience what they wanted and what generally they wanted was um, a kind of pairing. Two sets of lovers, one a constant couple who had some uh, opposition to, to their romantic union. The other was um, a, a witty couple, one rake and one clever woman who's trying to capture this rake. So it had that about it. it. It ticked that box, it had that formula. But what Ben also did with it was to complicate that binary with a character called Angelica Bianca, who was a courtesan. So, and Angelica Bianca added a darkness to that play that I think appealed to two different constituencies, really. It was quite bold because, because actresses were thought to be... When, thought to be prostitutes, uh, thought actresses were thought to be prostitutes by some people at that time. So by putting someone like that on the stage, she was smacking them in the face with it, wasn't she? She was, she was, I think. And Angelica Bianca is an extremely complicated character. She's not simply there as a prostitute. She's there as a devoted woman as well. And so I think that, yes, that's a very clever way of shutting down some of those arguments about what women in the public mm -hmm. sphere were like. And her initials, of course, yeah. are the same as Afra Ben's initials, so she's mm -hmm. AB. Mm -hmm. So there's some suggestion that Ben may have been playing with expectations about her image in this role. And she John has Tony, in, what, so. in what ways was the robe typical of Ben's ideas? I've read a lot from the three of you about Ben's ideas of masculine, feminine, uh, w w libertine, women can be libertines and so on. Could you develop that a bit? Well, I think she develops it more in the later plays, but it certainly starts here. Um, that dichotomy between the virgin who gets the rake, the man, the most desirable man, and the whore 
who doesn't but has the best speeches, I think mm-hmm. is going on all the way through. And these lovelorn women who are um, a little more experienced, are it, it's a feature of, of Afro Ben's plays. But I think what's there already is the notion that the world is stacked against women. Um, it's a patriarchal world and that women need to use their sexuality and to to use their wit and cunning to succeed in the world. Violence men have, so women are going Mm. to have to use guile. Mm. And if they don't, they will lose in the sexual game and therefore lose in the social game. So I think that's there already. Um, Did you say in some way legitimise the female libertine? I don't think anybody can quite legitimise it. I think a a female libertine... You came quite near it, as I understand. Well, I think it's... You can't be, I think, in the end, a female libertine, as, as um, Helena says. What would I get out of out of a, you know, sexual congress before marriage? Well, you know, a cradle full of mischief. Um, the the double standard is absolute, and the only people who came near to being female libertines are aristocratic women, and I think Ben admires those, but also knows that it's pretty difficult um, to be a libertine woman further down the social scale, even in. A, a wonderful work that she that's an anonymous work called Love Letters. Um, she has a woman who moves from being the virgin, the desirable virgin, into being um, a, a free woman. But in the end, she's a sort of wandering whore. There, there isn't a position in society for the female libertine. I but don't she did think. want people. Well, maybe, uh, but you're but, right. She did want women to be to be seen as to more independent and more and more liberated than they had been seen until then, as I understand it. What do you say? Yeah, I suppose I think I'd want to question... I think it's very... If you're thinking about the libertine as a kind of sexual persona or, or, or a form of sexual behaviour, then I think Ben is very clear that it's difficult for women to access that role. But if you think about libertinism as a kind of aesthetic or philosophy, I think yeah. Ben really did embrace that yes, idea. Yes, that's what I got so from the notion notes. of... Um, uh, the libertine, the term libertine in, cla- in classical Rome just means a freed slave. So a libertine is someone who, um, mm. we might say, thinks outside the box, refuses all systems, refuses rule, refuses convention. It's a kind of public blasphemy, arrogance <laughs> performance. You can see that in, a, in the figure that Ben most admired, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. And his surname, Wilmot, of course, is, is echoed in the name of the hero of the rover, Will Moore. Um, so it, that... That kind of role is being invoked, and I think Ben clearly identified with that and wanted to be seen as part of that libertine circle, mm. those um, young court um, thrusting cavaliers round um, Charles who were challenging convention, challenging rule, um, saw themselves as a new young generation um, taking over from the old um, Commonwealth men now manifested as parliamentarians. Um, and there's a very strong kind of libertine ethics or ethos. One way to put it is to sort of say, you know, Ben pursued a career in writing, not... She wasn't a kept mistress. We know very little. If she was, she kept that hidden. So it's in her writing that you see this kind of libertarian um, energy (laughs) rather than in her life. What place did marriage play in that scheme of things? She's always very sceptical about marriage. Most of her plays um, concern young women who are... or The majority of her comedies concern young women who are unhappily contracted to old men um, and want to get back to their young lovers who they've um, been separated from. So let's just be more specific. She isn't against marriage. She's against young women being unhappily contracted to old men. Unequal marriages, yes. yes. But she's also... um, I mean, she is against marriages because it's an institution, if you take this libertine ethic. So she has a kind of... Ben's an odd combination of idealism and pragmatism. So she has this longing for a golden age, a world in which there was no marriage, no contract. People give love freely. She often idealises that, but she also said... You know, she has a poem called The Golden Age in which all of that is idealised and then right at the end we realise this is all spoken in the voice of a man who's just trying to get a woman into bed with him. So this libertarian language she understands is something that rakes use to try and get women into bed. But come back to the... Sorry, Jan, but can I just pursue this one more time? But the idea of a female rake, which I mentioned earlier, mm. which which I, I've seen in the notes of some, one, one, or both, one or two of you, was, was, was not something you wanted to pursue, was not something she wanted to pursue... Well, I think when you think about the character of Helena in The Rover, there's a wonderful point when Helena says to um, Wilmore, I'm Helena the Constant, and he, uh, Helena the Inconstant, and you're Robert the Constant. And there she's sort of saying, 
I'm inconstant in the sense I can keep making myself into a new character to attract you and keep your attention. Whereas you, the, the, the supposedly the manifestation of the rake, Wilmore is actually a bit of a bore who's completely driven by his sort of sexual appetites. He's constantly looking for another woman. So she's the one who has the kind of flexibility, mobility to reinvent herself, make herself into a new kind of character, the sort of freedom that the libertine as an ideal might have. And then we're, we're living in a time of acquaint- at least an acquaintance, perhaps even a friend of hers, Nell Gwynne, who was very open about her status. Yes. I think, I think Ben wants to differentiate herself from actresses. I, I mean, I think she really wants to be part of this court wit group rather than one of the, identified with yeah. the actress. I, I just wanted to come in on the um, idea of the um, ethical liberty mm. because I agree with Roz on that very much. And one of the most extraordinary things about Ben is that she um, goes against religion and mm. very, very few women of the time could set up for almost for atheism in the way that mm. she does. She writes poems where she talks about faith as feeble um, she says that, that Christianity is, is the last shift of routed argument. Um, she even writes a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer in which she says, I haven't had enough daily bread, actually, and I'd like some more. <laughs> and as for trespasses, well, you should give in to them, good heavens. Um, Oscar Wilde fore- foretold. Yes. I mean, she, she is extraordinary in that respect. Um, and she um, very much admires the... Uh, the classical philosopher Lucretius, um, whom she reads in translation, um, and Lucretius thought that the world was all made up of, of shifting atoms, and so that when a person dies, then um, he or she just becomes a, a series of, of atoms floating off into the air. So there is no afterlife, and Ben clearly did not believe in an afterlife. Claire, <coughs> Claire Burdage, um, she was a very strong supporter uh, of, the, of the Stuart monarchy, Charles II for 25 years, and then of his brother James, even though he was um, opposed by a great number of people in the country. Uh, and, and I think maybe one or two of our listeners might think a very strong Tory mon- mon- monarchist, Tory loyalist, fascinated by the court, dazzled by it really, and a very strong, can we call a feminist without stepping on everybody? So can we just use it to be getting on with or mm-hmm. feminist, which is more of a slightly different position? What would you have to say about that? Um, I think that, indeed, we, we as critics of Ben, tr- struggle to reconcile these two, in one sense, very progressive ideas for her time in terms of her championing of women in the public sphere and her really quite staunch royalism. Uh, you know, they seem diametrically opposed. Uh, in a sense, she's quite clever in how she does reconcile these two things, though, um, because what she refrains from doing is looking back immediately to the Stuart line, if you like, um, in order to contextualise her support for both Charles as a Protestant, or at least a public Protestant, Mm -hmm. and James as a public Catholic and his heir presumptive. Um, What she does instead is support them in what might be thought of as quite feminine terms. Uh, So, for instance, she praises them as fathers, both, you know, fathers of their, in Charles's case, illegitimate sons, and fathers of the nation. So she couches that in domesticity, really, and she also looks back, as as Jan was saying, to to the classics and their the the kind of classical heroes are used in place of support of the monarchy uh, or support specifically of Charles or James. So her support works on really two different levels, I think, one on a quite learned level and one on quite a domestic level. Did the court repay her devotion to them? Um, We don't have any specific record of favours that were given to her, for instance. In 1681, she did dedicate one of her plays, the second part of the Rover, to the future James the uh, James II and one might assume she was in some sense remunerated for that whether financially or through some kind of court favour um, but I think if she'd received any kind of gratuitous favour she would have been satirised by somebody and we would know about that so 
I think it was probably proportional to either the work that she was doing or what other people were receiving. John, you want to come in? Well, I was just going to say that I, exactly we don't know, but towards the end of her life she was such a propagandist for James II mm. and very few people were as loyal as she was at the end. Mm. Um, so I have a feeling that she was paid at that point. Mm. Um, she's always short of money, so you can never really tell from the fact that she's short of money that she isn't being paid. Mm. But that... That slew of, of, of propagandist poems at the end, mm. um, all printed by the King's printer, mm. I would have thought that she was at that point being paid by the government of, of James II. Given and James II's Catholicism and, and uh, her, her attitude to religion, did that not irk him or did, was it not at odds with her I protestations think, of loyalty? Well, I think she can protest anything when she needs to and I think she sort of flirts with Catholicism. She certainly likes the bells and smells of Catholicism. Mm. She's very keen on the whole panoply of it. So I don't think she would be opposed. And I think she, unlike the majority of the nation, she saw James II as somebody who was tolerant. Um, and so when he was imposing Catholicism, she saw in a way that he was allowing tolerance. Mm. But her total devotion or apparent devotion, she's always equivocal, her apparent devotion to James II is something of a puzzle um, to most of us. Um, she sees him as, as some sort of extraordinarily heroic man, um, but somebody who's authentic and, in the end, guileless, and he falls because, partly because of that. But I don't think she was ever very keen on Charles II, actually. Ros, um she wrote fiction as well as plays, and her best-known book is Orinoco. But did she write fiction to make more money? The plays, she wrote a lot of plays, but we, we don't, they don't seem to be in the great money spinners of Dryden's plays, except perhaps mm -hmm. one or two of them. He did three a year on a contract and so on, or Congress plays, mm -hmm. however. Um, what's striking about this novel? A, did she turn to it for money? Because she's very straightforward about what she did for money and what she didn't. And B, what do you think of it? Well, uh, we've just been talking about... Um, James, and, uh, and it's important to remember that Orinoco is published in 1688 and it's published just as James is in real crisis. The bishops are refusing um, to cooperate with him um, and it's a story, at its heart, it's a story about a romance hero who has um, a pregnant wife um, and he murders her and their unborn child um, because he refuses to to be remain in slavery. He's an African prince who's enslaved um, in uh, South America, in Suriname. He's a Gold Coast prince. So although he's a, a black African hero, it's very evident when you look at this moment in which James ha and his wife Mary of Medina have just given birth um, to a baby boy, and that's the reason that, that James is being re removed from the throne, that, that Ben's publishing this novel. So it's still, it seems to me, part of her political... Um, um, commitment um, to James. During this conversation, it's been taken for granted that she did go to Suriname mm. in Southern. Do you all take mm. that for granted? Because it's doubted in your in your notes whether she did, whether or not she well, did. Well, I think go critics there. have doubted it. Historically, they doubted it. Um, and there's well, uh, there's, you three, there's, you can all say alleged, not unproved, well, and we, so on. Well, we can't be absolute mm. because we haven't found a diary saying here I was in Suriname. But um, there's a huge amount of circumstantial evidence that she was there. And if she wasn't, a woman remarkably like her was there, mm. also calling herself Astraea, which is, mm. after all, the name she uses all the way through. I mean, there are state papers that mention the women in Suriname. And it Why fits did she go to Suriname in the first place? <laughs> well, aha. Uh <-huh. laughs> we don't know, but I think she went as an agent right away. But oh, it's right. only We're still in the, still in the secret It's service, only yeah. speculation. I mean, she says her father was given a job as lieutenant yeah. governor of the... Island. That seems unlikely if he was a she, barber. Well, she always she gets herself into her own works. Her, her works are really faction. She often puts herself into what she's writing, mm -hmm. and when she does that, she nearly always elevates her birth. So, to come back to this novel mm -hmm. itself, what's most striking about it on the background? Um, I mean, it's a remarkable novel, uh, and it's it's much studied now. I think probably because it's we there's a debate about the extent to which it's making a case against slavery but at least one might sort of say that it's a it's a, a novel which exposes the kind of savagery at the heart of colonial government in that respect you could see it as as presaging a, a novel like heart of darkness like marlowe in heart of darkness the the narrator is a character in the novel who 
is is complicit with the English colonial government that she's also criticising for its cruelty to this noble African prince that it, who has been enslaved. He leads a slave rebellion. It's put down. Um, he's horribly tortured, murders his wife, and then he's publicly executed and his um, courted parts are sent around the colony. Um, she finishes saying this mangled spectacle of the king. Um, it's, re- it's recalling again Charles I's murder, so it's a wonderful kind of mixture of contemporary allegory and analogy and um, contemporary critique of the colonial situation. Still on the other side, as it were, <laughs> of, of the, the ocean, not of the life itself, Claire, uh, there's another late play, The the Widow Ranter, set in Virginia. Now, what's she doing there and why is she setting it in Virginia? Well, part of the real charm of The Widow Ranter is uh, its collection of very... Um, varied characters, because uh, part of the cast is made up of English men who have been transported to to the colonies. So they've committed a petty crime in England, and they've uh, been been transported over there. And because of the lack of government, it's up to them to form some kind of order. Mm. So there's on on the one hand there's there's that going on, as Ros was saying in in relation to Arunico. Um, there's a, there's a missing governor so a little bit of a topsy-turvy world and they those the two texts definitely share that uh share that aspect of what's the the widow ranting about uh the widow ranter is possibly as as close as we might come in ben to that female rake uh for one particular reason which is that she revels in smoking she smokes a pipe she gets drunk she's mostly drunk by lunchtime um and those kinds of physical pleasures that we might associate with libertinism are are kind of embodied in in the widow ranter but on the other hand she's um she's a wealthy widow so she herself was transported as an indentured slave when she got to the colonies she was bought off the boat to pay for her passage and as as such had to work for the the man who'd bought her. The man who'd bought her married her within six months and he was a wealthy colonel there and had, I think she phrases it, the, the grace to die quite soon thereafter and leave her... Unassisted. This, sorry? Unassisted. No Unassisted, yes. We don't know. We have no evidence, yes. <laughs> it's a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, this, um, this old skeleton has the good grace to die. Yeah. And leave her this wealthy widow. But so on the one hand, she's enjoying all of these bodily pleasures, and on the other hand, she is in love with a, a colonel there called, called Daring, and she's worried that he wants her for her money. And so she has to put him through these tests where she's checking his constancy and his motives because the fact that she's a wealthy widow leaves her with some problems. Because she's going, they're just going to marry her for her. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jan, briefly, do you, is there any way you would like to compare her briefly, her, her fiction with her playwright? Do you think she's a better novel writer, novelist than a playwright? Ah, I, I think she's a wonderful both, actually. Right. But her plays are what made her famous at the time, mm. and they are a lot of them are wonderful. Um, but we don't put on that many restoration plays now, so there's no doubt that at the moment. It's Orinoco and the other short stories that people tend to read if they're reading anything. Um, but if I can just go, can I just say one more thing about The Widow Ranter? Because I think that's a, it's a wonderful play because um, not only we, have we got The Widow Ranter in there and we've got the heroic bacon, um, but we've also got the sort of farce of government which goes through all her plays, a mockery of those people who think that they can rule other people um, and who think they can... Um, you know, the moment they get into power, they simply serve their own interest. And the moment these people get going in the widow ranter, they make themselves a great big punch bowl. Wow. Um, on the subject of her as a fiction writer versus a playwright, I'd say that um, in her fiction, certainly, you, you get this sense of theatricality. Mm. Uh, she's, she's very good at describing bodies in space. She's very good at describing expressions on people's faces in the way that she scripted them you know, already for her plays. And, and I think we mustn't underestimate her success as a playwright, whether you're thinking of her as a female playwright or not. I mean, between 16, 16, 1670 and 1680, 
eight. She has 18 plays put on the stage. Dryden has 14 and Durfee has 14. And that's the highest number for any male playwright over the same period. So she's extraordinarily successful as a playwright and she's really admired for this capacity, what what are called her her stage management, the way she manages Mm -hmm. stage space, the discovery scene, that moment when the shutters come back and you find a young couple in bed um, is much admired, and that plays through all of her fiction. She's, mm. she's one way to put it. Say, I mean, fiction is a really new form. The novel's really new, and she's bringing a lot of theatrical convention into the novel. Let's stick as it were with a couple in bed for a moment or two. She had a reputation. <coughs> at, sorry, Jan, but she had a reputation as a bawdy writer, didn't she, at the time? Is that true? Yes. yes. So, what was bawdy about it? Uh, it it's very bawdy. Well, um, give us a, one or two examples. It is early, but still. Well, never mind. let's we can say get I think uh, other people were bawdy too. Bawdy sex. Comedy was the mode, and yeah, that's why well, she wrote I know it. What was thought of as bawdy? Then. Well, um, the second play, for example, opens with two people getting out of bed, clearly having had sex and not being married. Um, she has plays in which uh, people go to bed with each other without realizing who they are, but it doesn't really matter. In the morning, they say, "Well, that was fun, wasn't it?" Um, people are not um, punished for their peccadilloes. Um, she has old men who come into the to supposedly the bridal chamber and open their um, their nightgowns and display themselves to the women. I mean, it's this pretty bawdy stuff. In fact, she was criticised for quite a lot of it um, once this kind of sex comedy had gone out of fashion. Although she does say that she gets more criticised yes, for it she because she's a woman writer. Yes. So she says other playwrights are just as bawdy as me. They don't get this kind of trouble. Yes, I think that she says that in the play that comes immediately after The Rover, Sir Patient Fancy, mm-hmm. where there's a yeah. scene in which um, the wife of Sir Patient Fancy is trying to hide the lover that she's got stashed behind the bed whilst her husband is trying to find you know, this lover. And she says that the women are the people that attacked her most. Mm. Can uh, we just... I, I brought that up partly just to, to, to talk about it because it was talked about, but partly because it was that aspect of her work which seemed to, as it were, strike her out of the lists for two mm. centuries. Her reputation was very mm. high, as you, mm. you pointed out, mm. Ros. 18 plays, mm. they must have kept wanting more, mm. and the fiction and mm. the poetry, we haven't even got to that. Um, mm. But she went right... Her, her reputation went right down... Mm. Why was that, starting with you, Jan? Well, I think that the Restoration itself was vilified as you move into the 18th century. The whole area, the whole period was seen as, as corrupt and licentious and a sort of blip on, on the proper well, Why did the people things. suddenly not like licentiousness? It, the, the, the world turned, became more moral. The, the Dutch king came in. The there Dutch. Was a, the Dutch, it's the Dutch. Um, it, it's a... The, the world has turned towards a, a more sentimental version of, of life. Um, the distinction between men and women is re-established. Uh, women are supposed particularly to be more associated with um, emotions and religion and with the virtuous side of life. And so Afro Ben sticks out now, not just as one of many playwrights who were bawdy, but as a woman who was bawdy. And as such, she is vilified constantly throughout the next century. There's a, there's a letter, there's a note in a letter from Walter Scott which summarises this totally. Yes, it's a wonderful to story. Yeah. So Walter Scott, although one can't help but think about the fact that Walter Scott's making the novel in the early 19th century, yeah, so he's sorting it out. Yeah. OK, I will get to the point. <laughs> so Walter Scott has a great aunt who says to him, yeah, I used to love these stories by Afro Ben, can you get hold of a few for me? So he's a bit surprised, he goes off, finds them, he sends them to her in brown paper because they're kind of a bit embarrassing to send. She writes back, sends them back and says... These are appalling. I can't believe I like these. She said, 60 years ago, I sat in company and we read these out loud and we loved them. And now I see just how crude they are. But that's fascinating because she also says, throw them on the fire. Yes. Although she, and then she says, but 60 years ago, people like myself, being a, gent- a woman of gentility, you, you sit around and, and read them aloud to yes, each other. Yeah. It's a fascinating little vignette of the way taste can change so swiftly. And it's a a complicated question, isn't it? Because Mm. one might sort of think, well, does this mean that women are are, are being recontained in the 18th century? But in a way, they're just being rethought as, Mm. in a way, moral agents. They're they're responsible for the 
the moral credit of the of the nation. Mm-hmm. And Ben is seen as someone who <laughs> discredited the morality <laughs> of the nation write, very <laughs> publicly in the late and now 17th century. You, among others, are re- re- revivifying, reasserting <laughs> well, the reputation. Can, can, we, can I just uh, that that quotation I started the program with about Virginia Woolf laying flowers on her grave? Do you think that do you go along with that, John? Um, did you go and lay flowers? I did. I did. I thought you in, might. In, <laughs> with Lucy Worsley in a, in a program, um, but I I think it, it's a tricky one. It's on every book about Afro Ben, pretty well mm. on the cover. Um, but Virginia Woolf, I think, brings her up or oh, back into history to some extent. But as a woman, as an amazing woman writer, and I don't think that Virginia Woolf really gave her her due as a, a, an actual creative writer. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a good quotation, and Virginia Woolf is famous, so it's useful that she said it, and it's very quotable. But it doesn't do justice to the great writer. Her, her reputation is being restored by persons like yourself and others, but is her legacy there at all, Claire? Um, I think she's left us a very interesting legacy, because as we've touched on at various points in this programme, she is a mass of contradictions, and several of her characters are masses of contradictions, and there's a lot for people like us and people like your listeners to work out with her. So, you know, we have the the feminism and the royalism uh, as sort of contradictory. We have characters in some of her fiction, you know, a nun who's also a bigamist, people like that... um, the courtesan who's the devoted woman. So there's an awful lot that she has to say that captures the fact that we're not all one-dimensional. You know, we do have these these kinds of can contradictions you see it, about I'm sorry, Tara. Mm-hmm. Can you see it uh, percolating through to your students and them saying, oh... Absolutely. Oh, I mean, I think she's really attractive to students. I mean, she's really attractive to modern culture because she's so adept at this blurring of gender boundaries. She's mm-hmm. praised for the combination of manly wit and feminine grace. In a way, she's a kind of... This, this playing with gender identity and the attraction of ambiguity around gender around gender disturbance is central to Ben's um, writing Mm. and to what makes her attractive then and makes her attractive now. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Ros Balliser, Jan Todd, Claire Bowditch. And if you have a topic for us that you think deserves a big radio audience, please send your ideas through our website or Twitter at BBC In Our Time by the 27th of October. Warren will be the subject of our programme on the 7th of December. Next week, we're discussing the Congress of Vienna after the Napoleonic Wars, which settled the balance of power across Europe for the next 100 years. Thanks for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. What major thing did we leave out? Poetry. Yes. We, we left yeah. out, Florinda. We left the out most poetry. And, poetry. Yes, I came we, to poetry on the... On and the equivocation thought. that is always in her mm. work. But I wanted to say the one thing we, that at the end of the, about the theatre is really one of the tragedies of, of literary history is that Pepys thought he was going blind and stopped writing his diary just before Afro <laughs> Ben enters the stage. Why didn't you say that? Well, because you didn't give me a chance to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you time. Ooh. With bags, and you could yeah. have taken the thing by the horns. Oh, yeah. I, I ask the most wide open no, questions. No, no, well, I don't want to be rude. Do I want to be rude? I do not. <laughs> yeah. Especially not to a man who's in such a disadvantage in being uh, in the minority. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I don't think the lack of peeps is a sort of great blow to the programme. No, I agree. No, to be it honest, isn't. Really. It just seemed to me Not a rather really. nice point. But it yeah. would be I think the poetry is, but I, did, I, I, I came up to the poetry and the structure and I thought we haven't got time. Mm. Uh, mm. We'd spent... Uh, we just spent quite a good time, and I, and I knew that would be a proper mm. discussion between the three of you, and I wanted to get to the fallen reputation mm. and the legacy mm. and the poetry, and I just didn't have time. So that's my. I mean, I point. think it's also yeah. poetry is a, a diminishing interest in art mm. now for readers. I mean, it's it's really interesting that Ben, you know, Ben's reputation has grown because people have become so fascinated by the novel oh, and the yeah, history so. of the novel. Mm. Um, and that novel, Orinoco, That's is it. particularly fascinating. So I think, um, and again, one could say restoration poetry is not widely read now, and it's a shame mm. because it's beautiful, it's occasional, it's got a real tone and temperament mm. to it that people can enjoy so much because it's really intimate and personal. Like Rochester, she's, she leaps out of the page and talks to you mm. in her yeah. poetry. But there, there are, and they're, they're poems that are often um, written in a social space Absolutely. and they're all answering each other, even things like The Disappointment, the famous one about um, uh, male impotence or <clears throat> premature ejaculation, mm. whichever. Um, 
that is obviously in a, a social setting where several others are writing poems like that. Mm. So it's, 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 I think it's very... Yeah. And if we were thinking about libertinism, I suppose that would have been the space that we could have said yes. here, in the poetry, what you see her doing is taking po- a style of poetry or a tone of poetry that men speak men in did. and making yes. women's voices heard in it. So at the end of this disappointment poem, like there's a little line that jumping. says, the nymph's oh, yeah. resentment's none Next. but I can well imagine Imagine. console. Yeah. You know, yeah. Here I, I am. I re- my, we did... Yeah, you make these decisions, don't you? I mean, that's that's what you've got. You've got to make decisions. And I, I actually, what you said convinces me that I made the right decision for the program. But it's, but it's a pity we didn't. On the other hand, this podcast is going to millions Absolutely. of people. Absolutely. So, so, so find a way about poetry. <laughs> tell, tell people to just Google this wonderful title: "To Fair Clorinda, Who Made Love to Me, Who Imagined More, More Than, than Woman." woman. So it's a title that leaves you thinking it's, it's what, <laughs> and the whole poem leaves you thinking Absolutely. what at the end. You Absolutely. simply thinking don't what know. what. Well, who exactly has done what with whom? Yeah. What's, what's the uh, what sex is it? Or where is, is the sex? The love where, where is it? And is it is it cerebral? Is it physical? What is it? What's going on? Do you? I mean, do you put? Do you see how her plays put on? Is so the Rovers just been on at uh, the RSC? At the RSC. Ah. And um, we we did, actually did a reading of the. How did it go down? Uh, very no, well. No. It it was um, we we were discussing it before, mm. and I, I thought it was slightly too singing and dancing as a production, um, whereas the previous one with Jeremy Irons had been darker some years ago. But it shows the fact that it is repeatedly put on. It shows that she has, is has, actable. I just wish they would do some others. It's the patient fancy, yeah. the lucky chance. It's uh, very hit and miss. I saw I'm not going to name it because I don't want to put down the director. But I saw seen a couple of restoration uh, restorations in the last few years. And they've been very unconvincing. Mm. I think, I think everybody it thinks if I'm because it's all bawdy, it's powder and that I've got to go. Mm. It, it's artificial from the start in a way that's it misses the point. I think it's mm. a lot of it is about the about training. People don't really train in restoration theatre in the way that they do in Renaissance right. theatre or in mm. um, or in modern theatre. So the, the, it's about getting the pace right, yeah. um, and it can be too slow or too fast. Or too fast. <laughs> they tend to throw themselves about. Absolutely. I think in restoration drama, as though that's the necessary thing. Yeah. And it's and very forward facing theatre. So you, your actors subtle. have to really engage the audience mm. and pull them into the story. They can't be just doing it in front of you. And in um, in restoration plays, there were kind of pauses between acts where there would be a musical interlude mm, and, so and so on. on. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, which we don't we don't have a modern equivalent for that. So unless you compensate or adjust for the pace in some kind of way and I, mm, I actually disagree point. with Jan and think mm. that the rover did it very well yeah, exactly. um, at the RSC with various musical interludes mm-hmm. um, but the uh, the whole kind of experience of the theatre is not one that we necessarily have an exact equivalent for so yes mm-hmm. I think uh, but I, I also think, think it's a shame that we don't see them because actually when you try and read the plays they're quite hard to follow people say this about mm-hmm. the country wife and the mm-hmm. man of mode as well everyone seems to be called will something or bell something yeah, right. and there are three different couples with different names when you see it on stage you understand how perfectly blocked these plays are so that you you know there are bodies playing these parts you see the difference between them you see the contrast between the couples working out physically mm. in front of you don't you i think that's absolutely true and i think they are very theatrical which is one mm. reason in fact they're not cinematic they're not e- they wouldn't easily yeah. be made I into that's a very good point I- yeah. into a, a, a television drama mm. then they're, they're mm. not like that mm. so i think that she's she's not in that world mm. and she has to live in the theater and the theater is not a hugely popular art but you could be <coughs> my chance I didn't see the RSC thing but the, these things could be reimagined we've got some very good <coughs> very good indeed directors and actors who are taking older plays and saying let's redo mm-hmm. it like this mm-hmm. I mean um, and it's working very well for instance so many people have taken a lump out of Chekhov and, yes. uh, and, and turned it into that eight hour play which your first play he wrote which has been uh, uh, cut into by David Hare, by Michael Frayn, by many others, and uh, uh, anyway, no, but I'm you sure have to have the, you have to have the audience, don't yeah, you? You have to make yeah. the punters come and buy the tickets, yeah. and it's the well, lack you could of do knowledge that by having by having a starry cast that yes, would solve that. Yes. Yeah. You've also got a problem with the, the rake is yes. also, I think, a problem in a lot of modern performances. Yeah. I think so. You know, it, th- that kind of predatory threatened rape scene is really hard to manage in front of a modern audience. I took my Absolutely. students to see the RSC production. And they managed it very well, actually, but mm. they were all of them were talking in, on the way back about, you know, yeah, how do we true, read this scene? What do we do this morning with, with, with what's on the news? Yeah. Well, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, what she's talking about doesn't go away. I mean, no. all the things she raises no. um, from the idea of, of, of rape and predatory men in power, because the relationship of power and sex is something very strong in, in no. Ben. From that to the farce of government, I think all this is, is and really and very the relevant. That the rape it's just evergreen. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that the rape so. backs away from rape because he thinks, oh, actually, this is a genteel woman. Yeah. So he doesn't yes. back away from it because he shouldn't be raping. No. He no. backs no. away from it because she's spot. Well, and, I think you've got your say in about the poetry. Like, we've got it in. It'll... I think that'll that is the uh, actually, <laughs> plenty of people here that I can't go around. I think the priest servants coming in to make an important announcement. Okay. I need to know if you want refreshments, tea or coffee. I'm okay, thank you. And for more podcasts on arts and ideas from the BBC, follow the link on our website to the best of BBC Radio 3's free thinking programme.